Hey, it's cold here, man. Uh, it's very cold. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you, comrades. I think uh, uh, we've just begun to be live now and uh, even on Facebook. And so Comrade Alex can then link to the SSP Facebook. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Welcome everyone uh, to this uh, CHI uh, webinar series that uh, we are having on the political economy. And uh, we, we have been having, this is now our third uh, uh, webinar in which we had our first one uh, last week, Thursday, and we, uh, with Comrade Rob Davis. And we had another one uh, on Thursday with Comrade Raj. And uh, we are quite uh, uh, excited today to have uh, also this opportunity for this kind of discussion and engagements with Corporate David Masondo. And so we, we welcome everyone that is joining. We can see uh, uh, Comrade Rob, Comrade Debo Hopadu, we can see Comrade Pat. Uh, welcome, comrades. Uh, um, and uh, we see Comrade Rasutan, we see comrades from CHI as well. So we, we welcome everyone, and there are others that are joining us uh, 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 as participants. So we welcome you all, comrades. Uh, so essentially, uh, 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 as we have been trying to do in the uh, uh, in the last two, just a brief explanation that uh, the Christian Institute obviously is an institute uh, uh, that we do. Uh, labor research, but also currently we have uh, a funding program from NSF for worker education research and research capacity development. Uh, but beyond that, we are tasked as well to be to, to really provide uh, left uh, uh, intellectual analysis to really be an avenue uh, for public engagement for 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 really providing alternatives to to neoliberalism and and, and the vast number of challenges that uh, that we are having as a, as a society and so an opportune time was provided by uh, uh, the the current uh, pandemic that forces almost all of us to really uh, 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 engage quite critically around what's happening within our society, within our economy. Uh, and, uh, those of us who are old enough, they will remember, uh, I remember around 93, 94, 95, uh, uh, some of those years I was in Cape Town and uh, there were a number of things happening. One of them was the industrial strategy project. And there was also the merge that was from the University of Western Cape and, and and I mean this during this time about towards the transition and the, the beginning of the transition, there were a lot of work that was done around what are possibilities for uh, for 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 our democratic transition about the economy and and I mean so many essentially quite critical things were uh, 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 were discussed and the research was done and 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 and, and essentially outputs were made out of it. Uh, unfortunately, as we all know, uh, not much of those things actually uh, came into effect in, in, in the actual implementation of what uh, that became the policies, uh, either economically in terms of industries or, or industrialization and many others. And so, uh, I mean, it might, it might be said that uh, the COVID probably provides another slight opportunity to really re-engage quite critically around uh, how do we see our country and how do we take our economy forward and what are the kinds of things that are really critical for us to 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 engage in and, and so that is why it is quite quite critical that we have these kinds of engagements and that we are trying to bring as much broad as possible uh, 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 voices uh, uh, to really be able to to broaden the scope around what is very variable alternatives to uh, to neo liberalism as we try to move forward, and so we really have a great pleasure that we have a uh, comrade David Masondo, whom, of which many of us probably know here. Uh, 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 Dr. Masondo is the member of the National Executive Committee of the ANC. And uh, uh, those of us who know him quite a long back, uh, uh, he also used to be 
uh, 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 the chairperson of the the national chair of the of the Young Communist League at some point in time. And I remember that during the student days, in fact, he was even in the in the SRC adverts. And so he has quite a long history of of activism, of involvement in the various structures, uh, 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 both as a student, but also uh, 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 as an activist. And so we we are quite uh, uh, eagerly anticipating uh, to to hear his his presentation. Uh, and so we will give him a time, and then after after he's done, we will have uh, first clarity questions, and then we will open up for the actual discussion, both here as well as for those who will be joining us through through the various Facebook networks. Thank you very much. Uh, 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 so I'm gonna give over to him uh, uh, right away. He has asked that we we just go ahead with it a, 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 as quick as possible. Comrade David. Uh, thank you, Comrade uh, Stembiso, uh, and, and good afternoon once more, Comrades. Um, I, I think um, we are in a period in which um, everyone is looking forward to solutions to the um, COVID worsened economic crisis. And I'm saying COVID worsened economic crisis. As the party correct, the party document correctly uh, stated that there was a crisis before this one. So um, COVID has simply worsened the uh, crisis that we had uh, before. And I think there's been a lot of reference to the Great Depression. A lot of people are likening the current crisis that we're facing to the Great Depression. And I think um, it does help to put the current crisis, though it's, it's, it's different in, in, in certain respects, uh, putting it in the, from the point of view of the, uh, the comparative look in relation to the Great Depression, assist in um, just putting the crisis within a broader historical uh, political uh, economy. So my input is simply, um, is, is actually coming from a document that I will further revise based on the inputs and, and, and thoughts that, and, and critiques uh, that I'm gonna um, receive from this, uh, from this seminar. So the, 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 my presentation is organized around four questions and, and forgive me for stating the obvious, um, in certain respects, but it's just to reinforce a certain understanding that all of us do have. The, so my, my presentation is organized around four questions. One is why and how the Great Depression happened, and why and how did countries get out of the Great Depression? And here I'm largely referring to uh, capitalist uh, countries. And uh, why did we have the 2008 Great Recession, what actually happened there, and how did the Global North in particular come out of that? And what are the lessons that uh, we should learn from both the Great Depression as well as uh, the uh, Great Recession that we had? I'm being asked to lower my voice because on the other side, the is also, uh, I'm at Kosadu House actually, so Harry Gwala lecture is also taking place at time. So I think there's some challenge insofar as my voice is concerned. So I will try to lower it. So th th that's how I basically organize my, my input. But before I'm cut, let me sum up my argument and then I'll illustrate it later. My key argument <clears throat> is that the Great Depression was enabled, it was not caused, it was enabled by the failure of the central bank to supply money to enable uh, or to support economic agents, business, workers and government to spend money in order to stimulate the economy. So instead of supplying money to the economy, the central bank, which is the Fed in the US, they basically raised uh, interest rates um, and there's an argument that the only thing that they could have done was to lower the interest rates because they could not have 
adopted what is called the quantitative easing, basically supplying more money through buying government bonds because of the gold standards. Um, I'm being asked again that I'm loud. Um, it's going to disorganize me. Okay. It's just going to disorganize because I'm connected to my internet here. I'll just lower my voice. Sorry about that. Yeah, it, it looks like, uh, uh, am I audible? Am I audible? Okay, sure. All right. So the, the key argument here, like I said, the, the reserve did not cause the depression, but they enabled it by failing to provide, to supply money to the economy for economic agents, business workers, as well as government to basically spend in order to stimulate the economy. Instead, what they did, they uh, constrained the supply of money by raising the interest rates. And there are people who argue that that's the only thing that they could have done. They could have, the only choice policy instrument they had was in order to supply money was either to um, uh, uh, reduce the interest rates and nothing else. Yes, they made a blunder by increasing the interest rate, which constrained the supply of money. And why people argue that there's nothing they could have done to do more than reducing the interest rate, it's on the basis that there was a gold standard. Um, according to the gold standard, um, you could supply money. Money supply was determined by the amount of gold that you had. So the gold standard itself acted as a huge constraint for supply of money. They could not have done what they did in 2008. My answer to that um, is that they could have done the same thing that is uh, abandoning the gold standard, which was abandoned by the British in 1931 uh, uh, in order to you know, uh, supply more money in the same way as they did in 2008. So they had a choice. It's not as if they didn't have a choice insofar as the gold standard is concerned. Uh, supply of money, as we have seen in the 2008 global economic crisis in which a lot of money was supplied to the economy uh, through different uh, measures, quantitative easing to bail out basically banks as well as uh, companies, GM, uh, which were basically bailed out by government at that time. The, we, we all are aware that, that those bailouts did not significantly trickle down to the poor uh, whereas during the Great Depression, what we have seen is that the intervention, the way in which the government came out of those Great uh, Depression is through, was through uh, uh, budget uh, deficit, spending a lot of money, but they made sure that the money doesn't end with the businesses, with banks, but it came, it was, if you like, a recovery uh, from below, in which there was direct employment by the Fed, I mean, by, 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 by the government under the, the New Deal. So the contrast between the bailout, so to speak, of um, the way in which people, the government came out of the Great Depression in the 80s was through massive infrastructure uh, uh, um, and, and employing people directly because the Traditional roles of business, which was employment, which was investment, were significantly affected. Uh, the the so-called business confidence was very low, and the state assumed a lot of functions that were traditionally uh, assumed or played by uh, 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 business in terms of employment, in terms of investment, under those conditions. So coming out of that Great Depression through budget deficit financing, the financing came from below. The, you know, the, the, the recovery came from below by employing people directly into a number of uh, activities. But in, with the 2008, what we've seen is the bailouts which did not necessarily trickle down to the, to the poor. So the lesson therefore for us in this period, in my view, is A, we do need to adopt unconventional financing uh, measures uh, which will require serious consideration 
uh, of some of the proposals that have been put out there by our reserve uh, bank, but also look at the, the savings, the retirement funds. We, let, we really have to think hard about how we use the um, unconventional financing measures to basically try to get out of, if we're to recover, or reconstruct the economy post uh, COVID. But what the two great re the depression and the great recession teaches us is that um, uh, we need to avoid bailouts from the above. As I, I, I indicated that uh, bailouts of companies does not necessarily trickle down. And therefore, whatever funds we are going to generate from conventional and unconventional means must be geared towards a recovery that is uh, aimed at creating job and build the productive uh, economy. So that's the summary of my um, uh, argument. Now, answering the first question on why the um, Great Depression happened. Firstly, this was not the first depression that capitalism uh, experienced. I mean, there was a crisis in the 1840s, which led to the failures of the 1840s revolution. And actually, this crisis forced Marx to go and really write uh, capital because he really wanted to understand the nature of capitalism, how it works in order for him to basically predict the crisis. The crisis of the 1880s uh, led to uh, imperial, more imperialist uh, ventures, capitalist imperialist ventures, which eventually led to the First World War. And it is this, after this war that the US came out stronger and for the reason that I'll just mention here. But I think it's imp the reason I think we need to emphasize the, or look at the crisis without getting into the Marxist uh, theory of crisis and other crises which are not necessarily Marxist. It's simply to say that it's important to separate the triggers of the crisis, that is the shocks from what makes the a crisis possible and probable under um, capitalism. Uh, because a trigger, it's not necessarily a cause. Uh, it does not make the crisis, it's, it's different from uh, what makes the crisis uh, possible. And what makes the crisis possible as we all are aware under capitalism is that it, this is a system based on uh, market expectations. Uh, that is when an enterprise set up investment, uh, the expectation is that they will make profits through sales. And um, those expectations may not be realized because these other people or companies that are selling, they may sell at a lower price. And therefore the price at which another a business is selling may not be a price that the consumers, so to speak, may be willing to basically buy at it if they have to make a choice between buying uh, commodities that are sold at different prices. And because of production costs, uh, different enterprises, they may not be able to realize their profits because they may not be able to sell at a profitable uh, price. And therefore that's what makes the uh, the, the, the crisis of capitalism possible. And even merchants, when they sell, uh, buy the stuff in order to sell, they have some expectation that they will sell at a, 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 a price which is above what they bought. You know, selling, buying cheaper and selling dear, that type of an arrangement. Banks as well, when they give a loan, their expectation is that they will make a profit by uh, through interest rates including students, you know, when they study, the expectation is that they'll find work. They may not find work. So the whole system, because it's market dependent, um, based on expectation, it's inherent that um, the crisis is more likely to, to happen under those, um, under the system in which we operate on, uh, under. So like I said, the system is based on expectations which may not be realized. And the crisis, the possibility of a crisis is not because of the external shocks like the COVID. Yes, the external shocks, oil and all that may trigger the crisis, may worsen the crisis, but the crisis is inherent within the economy in which we, um, 
live in, which is a capitalist system which based on competition in which people's expectation is about sales. So by saying this, it's simply to say that the crisis does not depend on shocks because the mainstream theoretical framework on the crisis is really based largely on shocks which disturbs uh, demand or supply. And, uh, and, and a lot of conversation that we've had in the mainstream has been to treat the shock um, as uh, something that um, it, it, it is the cause of a crisis. They will either cite the cause. Uh, so everything that is we, we see as a crisis, it's something external. It's not within the system itself. Even the environmental uh, crisis that we have, which also disturbed nature and produced disease or diseases such as uh, COVID, is seen as something that is not inbuilt within uh, the system. So to sort out the problems of the system is really to deal with externalities, external shocks and all that. I thought it's important for us to, to, to really laid it out there that the, um, it's inherent, the, 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 the crisis is inherent within the modern economy under which we operate. And it's not because of the shocks. The shocks can act as a trigger to cause the, the crisis, but they are not necessarily the, 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 the cause of the, of the crisis. They can exacerbate, they can trigger the, the crisis of, of capitalism. Now, coming back to the depression, um, and I won't be long here, like I said, the Reserve Bank enabled the Great Depression. It did not cause the Great Depression. Post First World War, the US, after the imperialist war that Lenin calls it, uh, the imperialist war of uh, 1914, which uh, was essentially another response to the crisis of uh, capitalism, which I will not go into now on how the way in which the crisis was being resolved, the methods to basically recover from that crisis. But the US came stronger out of the, uh, you know, after the, sec I mean, after the First World War, including after the Second World War. And for instance, their manufacturing was growing significantly in 1920s, uh, 1926 to 1929, the profits were tripling. Uh, the stock exchange was also a stock exchange, which is a place in which people buy shares. Uh, uh, the companies uh, raise money through selling shares, but also issuing bonds. A lot of people were buying bonds. I mean, were buying shares because the companies were doing very well. And the share price was also going well because the profitability of these companies were very high and, and everyone thought that they could make money uh, out of buying of the shares. And then the share price was also going up, the demand was high. And uh, banks as well and stockbrokers were also encouraging people to buy shares. And they also provided loans to enable people to buy stocks and all that. And this American dream in which everyone was really excited about, unfortunately, it was not equally shared. Um, firstly, um, the, as the real wage, the, the real wage was going down, the profits were going up, but also business competition amongst business people was also intensifying. Some of them could not sell above the uh, price that was going to be profitable because other people were competing with them and uh, their production costs were higher. So it was not like a smooth, nice um, American a dream uh, which was being realized there, but it was riddled with the inherent uh, contradictions of uh, capitalism. The real wage, as I said, was going down while the labor productivity was going up and not all parts of the United States were developed. The process of capitalism, as we know, it's very uneven. Not everyone was included in rural areas, larger part of rural America and was excluded from the market. They could not buy the autos. They could not buy refrigerator, electric appliances. Some of them did not even have electric light. The farmers, some of them, they had a low, 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 very income. But some of the farmers, of course, were doing well because of the mechanization of farming. There was overproduction of uh, food and all these kind of things. So 
it's against that background that the um, when the price of um, the shares was going up, everyone was trying to basically uh, buy the share. The share price went very, very high. But I'm not so sure what actually triggered the panic. I mean, in the, the, the historical evidence of what actually triggered the panic in which people were withdrawing money from banks and uh, wanting their money is not very clear. But from what we can see from the literature is that there was a lot of panic people were drawing their monies and um, that caused a lot of panic. And instead of the Reserve Bank um, coming in, in uh, supplying money, they raised the interest rates. And like I said, they could have done the things that the Fed did in the uh, 2008, quantitative easing and undertaking a number of measures to basically supply the economy. So the business confidence was very low. Business confidence simply mean that capital is not interested in investing because their expectations of profitability are very low. Households incomes were basically uh, even disturbed. I mean, squashed by the uh, collapse of the economy in that regard. Government uh, income from tax revenue was very low. So the economic agents, which could have spent the money in order to recover the economy, they were not spending the money. And like I said, government had no money and the monetary policy did not also assist in that regard. They raised interest rates and they could not provide more money through quantitative easing. Now, how did countries come out of the Great Depression? Um, they came out of the Great Depression um, by spending, government spending more money the Great Depression, like I said, was partly caused by the Standard Bank to act as a lender of last resort. And they came out of the Great Depression by government acting as a spender of the last resort. To the extent that Keynes, uh, who became very influential during the Great uh, Depression and in the recovery post Second World War, he made a very interesting appeal, and I want to quote it here. He suggested that, I quote, world finance ministers should in consent print money all together at once as a means of restoring confidence to world market that was frozen in the face of economic failure, close quote. So Keynes here was suggesting that it's important to uh, get the economy back working for government to basically spend more money. Now, fast forward, uh, so the period between 1950 and 1973 represented a high economic growth. I mean, the world economic growth was ranging average 4%. Uh, so it's also called the period called golden age, characterized by high real wage, high employment, economic growth, profits, and all that. But from the 70s, as we all know, um, the crisis hit, and it's not because of the oil shock, uh, because even in the left, the way in which we analyze the cause of the crisis in the 70s, we cite the oil, uh, the, the increase of the oil price, which raised the production costs for companies which affected their profits. Um, it was not, the, the, the oil, yes, acted as a shock, but the competition amongst uh, businesses uh, led to loss of uh, sales by certain companies. They were not making good profits because of the intensification of profit. And the response to that crisis was in order to lower production costs was that no, we need low taxes. And the welfare state was being challenged significantly. And as the state was not able to generate enough revenue, they got into a lot of debt. And, and some people, they said from the 1970s, you had a shift from a state being a tax state to a data state because it was incurring a lot of debt since the economy was not growing because the economy growth is important for the state because that's the only way, one of the ways, and in fact, the main way through which uh, the state extract revenue for itself. If the economy is not growing, the profits are low, uh, there's no possibility. The chances of generating revenue are very low. But secondly, <laughs> The real wage was beginning to decline uh, during this period. 
And because of the fall in the profitability in the real economy, we have seen the shift from the productive investment in the economy to finance, uh, which is now called financialization. The growth of financialization start to pick up around that period because the site for, for capital accumulation profitability was beginning to decline. And what was the response by different economic agents to this? Like I said, tax is low, government began to, to borrow. This is a study, by the way, which has been done by the World Bank. It's a very interesting study that we need to look at. It traces the rise of debt from the 70s. It's titled, I may, be wrong, I may not be getting the, the title right, but it's Global um, Debt Waves from the 70s. And, and, and it, it, it's very interesting that it shows how the state from that period, they basically relied on borrowing uh, for them to basically sustain themselves and the economy. Now, it was not only the government which was, or governments which were basically borrowing, but also as workers' wage was also going down, there was a lot of financing of um, uh, household consumption through borrowing. So finance was, I mean, got highly, highly involved also in uh, borrowing uh, workers uh, who are now beginning to depend on borrowing in order to substitute or uh, augment their wages which were going, uh, which were low. Um, and, and then housing began to be used as a collateral, as significantly as a collateral for workers to basically get more work. And many of them began to work so hard uh, extra time, um, so capital, finance capital also became some kind of instrument to um, make sure that workers work uh, more hours in order to get more um, um, income for themselves, but finance was also central in helping them to augment the interest. And I mean, we, we know that uh, South Africa was also affected by this uh, phenomenon uh, of the falling profit rate from the 70s. The Devon worker strike, I think, was a response uh, to that. Um, I mean, we can get into that at some point. But all I'm saying is that as incomes for different economic agents, the state, uh, workers, but also business, the borrowing became a significant way, a strategy through which people generated their incomes in order for them to continue to live, to, 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 to um, reproduce themselves based as businesses, but also as uh, uh, states and, and as workers. Now, it is against that background, in my view, that we should understand the 2008 financial crisis, that uh, the mortgage, the housing crisis was a trigger of the crisis, was not the cause. I mean, given this, um, background uh, circumstances that I've just laid out, it, it became, um, if you like, some kind of, I wouldn't say inevitable outcome, but it made sense that uh, the, a lot of people borrowed a lot of money and banks were also providing uh, loans, um, significantly developing different financial instruments to basically extend credit to different um, uh, economic uh, agents. And like I said, household consumption, even here in South Africa from 1997 to 2007, it was pre supported significantly far by uh, debt. And uh, we also all know that the growth in, two, in the 2000 was also supported by uh, consumption through provision of loan, but also the commodity boom in China and all that. So like I said, housing became an asset according, uh, against which loans and financing was provided. So now when the um, businesses got into trouble in 2008, um, profitability going down GM because they could not compete, they had to rely largely on debt and that debt um, could not be repaid. And many of them, they basically got bankrupt. So it was not just households and government that were getting uh, bankrupt, but all economic agents were getting 
uh, household balance sheets were getting into trouble, debt was increasing, their assets were, being, were getting um, uh, lower and lower in terms of their, uh, if you look at the, for lack of better, with the capital structure in their balance sheet. And we're all aware that $4 trillion was uh, put together by the United States to basically bail out some of these companies. Like I said at the beginning, the stimulus package was largely, um, it, it was not the same as what we've seen during the Great Depression, which was stimulus from below, which aided and supported workers, households from below in different ways. So the question is, does South Africa, and I'm moving towards closure here, having laid out or tried to lay out this experience, the Great Depression and the Great Recession, it's very clear that uh, there were different stimulus um, which got the world out of the Great Depression in the 40s, 30s, and the modes of recovery were different from the ones in the 2008. Now the question for us is, does South Africa need a stimulus? And my answer is that yes, we do need it, but the fiscal is constrained. Uh, I mean, the minister in 2000 and 2020 February budget showed how constrained the fiscal space is constrained, actually almost to non-existent. And the COVID situation has made the situation worse. Uh, there will be a tax shortfall of 300 billion. The borrowing costs are very high. And uh, for every rent we borrow, we pay 20 cents back. So it's not as, as, as interest. So the, 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 the cost to service that debt, they are also getting higher and higher. So the stimulus, yes, is required, but the fiscal is highly, highly constrained. And uh, I mean, the minister next week, he will be laying out the the, 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 the clear picture in so far as the fiscal situation that we are facing in South Africa. And uh, he will basically present a picture that all of us will have to really think about on how we basically deal with this. Now, having said that the fiscal space is closed, what are other options that we basically have? I think for me, the burning question today, it's whether the central bank should be the lender of the last resort for government to stimulate the economy. And it does look like the reserve, uh, the monetary policy seem to have a relative uh, better space than the fiscal policy. And hence they could reduce the interest rate by bonds in the secondary markets. And there've been a number of suggestions as well that they should buy the bonds from the primary market. And my reading of the documents that the Reserve Bank has basically uh, produced, for instance, the financial stability review that they produced, I think it was in uh, I think this May or beginning of June. Uh, is a, I mean, you can go on their website and look it. There's a very interesting statement that they make that, and I quote, that they've done, they've intervened in different ways. And they are, to quote the Reserve Bank, they say, we stand ready to tackle additional action should the need arise. So I think we should give them space and uh, see how they basically navigate through the instrument that they basically have. It doesn't look like they are ruling out the suggestions that have been put out there on the buying of the uh, uh, government bonds from the, from the primary market. So having said that the fiscal space is closed, it doesn't mean that uh, there are no other uh, mechanisms that unconventional financing mechanisms that we should be looking at, including the retirement funds, unit trust, and I must say that economic growth does not come from mere savings, that just by mere savings that you have, you're definitely going to have economic growth. Otherwise, countries such as Portugal, Spain, and Netherlands would have been the first capitalist countries to have developed. So the issues about the deployment of the savings that we have productively, yes, the savings rates is still very low in South Africa, 
from what people say that it's supposed to be above 14 percent but it's very low so we have to think about how do we increase the savings but we also need to think about how do we use the savings that we already have because during the De great depression the dominant view was that unused savings will pile up in the banks and the market forces will force down the interest rate to a point where business owners will be tempted to go and borrow. So don't do anything, just allow the savings, savings to pile up and you know they will reach a point where uh, they will come down and businesses will basically come and, and borrow and in that way the economy will recover. I, 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 I don't think um, it, it works that way. In fact, Keynes during that period argued that savings will actually shrink along with the declining uh, economy. So as the economy declined, the monies that uh, we have saved will also be badly uh, affected. And he argued that uh, it's important for those savings to be uh, deployed uh, productively uh, into, the, into the economy. So, um, I mean, under capitalism, we, we all know that uh, the retirements and savings are also dictated by the profit logic. So as people who have saved the money, at the end, when people retire, they want good returns. Uh, so they don't want their savings to be lost in the um, uh, some investments that will not produce a good return for them. So I think what, what exactly should we do therefore under these uh, circumstances. I think the, for me, the question is whether um, should we define the notion of return to include long-term um, economic development, which may include infrastructure for working class communities, because surely when the working class retire, they will need to have good infrastructure uh, so that they will retire uh, nicely. Not, I'm not saying that they must wait until they retire for us, for them to have a good economic infrastructure, social infrastructure for their own social reproduction. Actually, as they live now, they need better infrastructure. So we really need to uh, have some conversation on defining the returns uh, beyond the immediate um, um, uh, notion of, of return, which could also be very short term in certain regards. And that brings me to the debate that COSATU has put forward insofar as ESCOM is concerned. Uh, COSATU has put a proposal that um, the PIC um, loan that was advanced to ESCOM must be converted into equity. Um, so at the moment, the PIC is earning returns for those retirement funds through getting interest payment from ESCOM. So if, if you change the, um, the loan, you, you, you convert the loan into equity, it means that the way in which workers will earn the return, it's no longer going to be through interest payment. It is going through dividend since there will be shareholders. Because once you're a shareholder, you no longer get your income through um, interest payment. You get your income or your returns through dividends. And dividends depend on the performance of a company. If the economy is not, I mean, the, the, the company is not able to generate enough uh, revenue, the company will rely on uh, uh, more equity, more debt, and that's why they basically get into uh, bankruptcy and, and have liquidity uh, problem, financial issues. And from time to time, they, they request for bailouts uh, precisely because if the costs are high and the revenue is low, you've got to always keep, find a way of dealing with that gap. Otherwise, the company will basically go insolvent. So. The, the, for me, the question of converting debt into equity uh, cannot be resolved or discussed or solved from outside without dealing with the question on how we improve the operational efficiency 
uh, of ESCOM because I fully agree that ESCOM is big to fail. Uh, for us to recover um, or to have the post-COVID economic recovery uh, or reconstruction, um, capital accumulation will depend on electricity, social reproduction of workers, their needs will also depend on electricity. But we, we cannot talk about the debt and uh, converting the debt into equity, which will enable workers to be shareholders, uh, uh, equity owners, without discussing the issue about making sure that XCOM actually improve its operational efficiencies. Otherwise, I mean, the, the, the debt uh, is, is a symptom. It's not a cause of all companies, whether it's private or public. It's a reflection of some of the costs that they basically have. And if we were to turn around ESCOM, we cannot just discuss the issue about the finances. We also have to debate and discuss the issues about the operational efficiencies, their cost structure, uh, which by the way, it's, it's also largely driven by the cost of primary energy. So I think it would be important for us as we discuss some of the measures, uh, 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 other financing mechanisms to pose certain questions about the, um, uh, the conditions under which we need to bail out or support some of the strategic companies, whether private or public. I mean, for an example, uh, Asolo Metal is in trouble. It has been in trouble for a while. If we were to support it financially, there has to be certain conditions. And we must, in my view, support is a solo metal because you cannot talk about serious infrastructure, serious reindustrialization if you have not still. Uh, all buildings that we're going to have, if we're serious about infrastructure, they will require us to think seriously about steel. But our solo metal is in trouble. So, whatever financing mechanism, whether we get um, some kind of uh, support from the uh, if they decide from the Reserve Bank uh, or the, the, some willingness from the savings, the pension funds and other savings to support the economy, we, we've got to put uh, serious conditions. Otherwise, we may have a situation in which we bail out whether it's private companies or public companies, situation where there's no improvement and they don't add value insofar as the economic growth and development is concerned and the money doesn't trickle down as we have seen in the uh, 28 uh, financial global economic crisis. And um, like I said, uh, the, the way in which we need to be thinking about the support, financial support for the economy, including for both public and private companies, we've got to put certain strict uh, condition. The land bank is in trouble as we are aware now. If we were to really think uh, about agriculture supporting farmers as part of and parcel of supporting the productive economy, we've got to think very hard about certain conditions that we put into both the uh, for the uh, private companies, but as well as the uh, 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 public uh, uh, companies. So, um, so in in short, I'm, I'm simply saying that whatever money that we're going to get in order to stimulate the economy, we must just make sure that we put very strict conditions because some of these monies, whether we get them from the QE or any other form of sub financial support, it may go to uh, corruption, it may go to uh, paying uh, debts and dividends uh, to different uh, companies like we've seen with the 2008 uh, global uh, financial uh, crisis. So we, so we need to make sure that this money goes into infrastructure, more or less like what we've seen in the 2008, 2009 global economic crisis, the way we, the government responded in our case by putting more money into infrastructure. Yes, that did not really um, help us to close the budget deficit and other economic challenges, uh, but it was a step in the right direction so it would be important that we make sure that uh, whatever money we get, we put it into infrastructure, into the network industries. Because if we don't do that, where we just get money and pump it into the economy, 
and it does not produce good uh, economic and development results and as well as social reproduction, we may have problems of inflation and, and other related problems uh, which we've seen in other parts of the world. So in conclusion, um, my, the Great Depression was enabled by the central bank, um, like I said, by not supplying the money, uh, by not acting as a land of the last resort. Uh, the countries came out of the Great Depression by spending money, uh, their government spending money. And like I said, the fiscal space is highly constrained. We really need to think about other unconventional methods, some of which they don't fall within the ambit of the national treasury. So if uh, those uh, unconventional ways of getting money are realized, uh, I think it will give us as a country, as a society, a good fiscal, a financial space to basically reignite and rebuild the economy. Thank you, Chairperson. I end here. Thank you very much, Comrade David, uh, um, 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 for your presentation. Um, and so uh, uh, it's much appreciated. And so we are firstly just going to give opportunity for if there are clarity seeking questions um, and uh, for the people that are here on Zoom, you can just uh, click on raising a hand uh, so that we can note you. And then uh, uh, Hadi and Deboho will, and, and, and Noctola will help us with the people that are on Facebook. So firstly, let's just find out if there are any clarity seeking questions before then we can allow the actual more substantive questions that can be asked. Uh, So here on the comrades that are here joining us on Zoom, is there anyone that is raising a hand or do we have a clarity? Uh, Mehadi, is there any question that is arising from the Facebook? Okay, there doesn't seem to be any. So it uh, doesn't there look is a, like there is a question, uh, comrades there. Not sure, yet. sure, sure. From uh, Asanda Benya, if I may read it out for you. Yes. Comrade Masondo, my question is around your argument, which is that government spending is a way of stimulating the economy. In South Africa, the finance ministry seems to be against that. There have been calls for the universal basic income grant, something more substantial than the MIEGRA 350 rand, which isn't basic income grant. Uh, assuming that people are currently getting it, what would the South African government consider a universal? Why would the South African government consider a universal basic income grant as a way of stimulating the economy post COVID nineteen crisis? That's the question. Yeah, I, I think for, for me it's important to. To draw a line between what is desirable and what is possible. Um, and a question about possibility, it's also ideological. Um, what the reality is that, like I said, the, the fiscus um, is it's highly constrained in, in many respects. And therefore, we need to think about other methods, uh, not just of uh, financing uh, whatever we ought to finance, but we also need to think about the methods of growing the, um, the, the, the economy because the tax revenue um, only comes, I mean, the increase in so far as the tax revenue only comes when the economy is growing. In other words, you have businesses which are making money and then you tax them, people are employed, you tax them, and in that way, you are in a better position to basically um, um, assist, uh, provide um, services, including some of them should be universal. Um, and the Scandinavian countries, they're not providing uh, those welfare 
services, um, uh, decommodifying certain services out of nothing. They do that because their economies are basically uh, growing. Um, in Sweden, the way in which they also recovered out of the Second World War, they basically had a pet on how they uh, grow the economy. They even agreed that, look, certain industries, we're just going to allow them to basically die and we'll focus on this one and this should be the wage and uh, the level of taxation for everyone, including workers, will be at this level. Now, if you're not growing your economy, um, and, and the question about growing the economy as well, it's also about the measures that we need to undertake. So I don't think that anyone will have a problem, um, let me say anyone, but uh, um, I don't think that the, the issue about the universal uh, uh, income grant is a question of no, people don't want it, but it's under what conditions will that uh, be, 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 be possible? Um, so I think that the current circumstances which have basically constrained the fiscal options um, and it's related to the growth of the economy uh, have basically made it difficult for um, national treasury itself to basically or government to basically uh, have universal uh, social uh, grant. As to whether it is desirable, I mean, I will personally support it, but under these constraints, this is a difference between wanting and what is basically possible under the circumstances. Uh, thank you very much, comrade. Uh, I have hands, uh, there is uh, comrade Rob Davis, uh, and there is Comrade Deboho Padu, uh, there is Tabang Sofalafala, and there is Comrade Tengo Tangela. Uh, so let's just have them in that order. So first Comrade Rob Davis, Comrade Deboho Padu, uh, um, Comrade Swala, um, Tabang Sofalafala, Comrade Tengo Tangela. Oh, sorry, I, I, I forgot there's also Comrade Dumako Vude. So in that order, Comrade Rob. No, 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 thanks, uh, thanks, uh, uh, Comrade Chen. Thanks to Comrade David for uh, his presentation. Um, I think the most uh, important thing that I would want to take away from uh, what Comrade David has said is that, uh, and I don't want to, uh, you know, disabuse uh, or abuse uh, what I'm going to say, but is that we we hear the, the the Deputy Finance Minister saying we need to have unorthodox. Uh, funding methods. And I think that is uh, something that needs to be followed through because, uh, you know, as he's pointed out, uh, a lot of the decisions are in the hands of the Reserve Bank and he's citing the Reserve Bank's independence. And I think that if, if uh, uh, the Reserve Bank does need to be drawn into this conversation in a much more uh, serious and uh, integrated way than I think... Uh, perhaps uh, they have been in the past, because <clears throat> I would say that one of the, the big lessons of the, of the Great uh, Depression was uh, the failure, first of all, of the Hoover government, uh, you know, is that partly by, because of the gold standard, but also generally of uh, fiscal conservatism <clears throat> that uh, turned a stock exchange crash into a, a, a long-term crisis of uh, unemployment and general uh, depressed uh, economic conditions. And actually, there wasn't only one way that the thing was resolved. Uh, arguably, the, uh, the, the New Deal didn't uh, resolve the crisis either. It wasn't resolved until the First World, the Second World War. And one of the other answers to it was fascism. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, I would say that we, we need to take this thing with the, uh, with the actual seriousness that it deserves because <clears throat> what we're facing in South Africa now is, as we argued in our, our paper, that uh, we will see uh, a, um, a bounce back uh, that is going to be far below uh, the levels of, uh, of, of, of employment that we had even in the crisis before the crisis, which was bad enough. 
And any kind of uh, failure, I think, to rise to the challenge is going to mean that the uh, effectively that uh, we're going to have a long period of depression with goodness knows what the political consequences will be, what the consequences for the National Democratic Revolution, for our democratic order, and all that will be. So I think that uh, that really we need to, 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 to you know, uh, what is the uh, unconventional finding that we need? Uh, that's going to be the next debate. But if we can get at least some kind of a consensus nationally that it does have to be unconventional funding. It does have to mean that the Reserve Bank will have to buy government bonds. I think that something like that is is like a first uh, a first point of uh, of of of, uh, of 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 contact that we really need to establish. The second point I'd make is that <clears throat> I think Comrade David was speaking to it a bit, but the uh, the, the 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 quantitative easing. Uh, that we saw after the Great Recession was highly partisan. It was releasing funds to bail out banks in the first instance, okay, manufacturing companies as well, but fundamentally banks, uh, allowing them to carry on with speculative activities and not actually putting the resources uh, into the things that were going to make a difference to the people, even of the United States or whatever, whatever. And so I think that the uh, definition of where the money goes uh, through the quantitative easing or uh, buying of bonds or whatever we call it, uh, unconventional funding, but with the Reserve Bank plan role, that's kind of like quite critical uh, in the whole thing. So those would be my, my, my comments uh, on this. But uh, I, I do just really want to just uh, repeat and underscore the point that I think if we uh, we are in a, a serious enough situation now, which is worse than the Great Recession, and arguably we never recovered from the Great Recession in South Africa, uh, even though we had uh, structural unemployment before that. But uh, if we don't um, uh, rise to the occasion on this on this particular uh, thing, I think we're going for a long period of economic stagnation uh, with all kinds of very, very negative consequences for uh, our people and our country. Thank you. Thank you, Comrade Rob. Uh, Comrade Dabojo, Padu. Yes, uh, uh, evening everyone there. Um, I just want also to highlight uh, two points, three points uh, coming from, uh, uh, you know, uh, Comrade Mastondo's um, input. Uh, I think, um, I think uh, we can, agree you know with his uh, emphasis of the need uh, for unconventional uh, measures you know thinking the unthinkable this is what we need right now and i think that that should guide us you know when we uh, look for uh, work towards recovery and, and all that uh, but uh, I think uh, it was too lacking on, on what are those unconventional measures, except where I noted that you, you said that uh, we must, uh, there is a space in the, in, the, in the monetary side of things, but there is no space in the, in the fiscal side. I think we should not... Uh, contradict the two, the two goes together. Uh, you can, um, uh, if we're able to bail out uh, people through this uh, buying of bonds, uh, we can bail out the state, we can monetize the fiscal deficit. Okay, am I back now? Yeah. All right. I was just saying that we need to um, uh, look at how we can, uh, uh, you know, fund the deficits using uh, the uh, the monetary side of things. So the word constraint must be must be uh, checked along those lines. Uh, let's not uh, close the space there for. For us, instead of bailing out uh, the, the private banks and so on, we, we bail out the state uh, through the Reserve Bank. Um, 
The other important point uh, I wanted to raise is about that uh, I think uh, if there's any lesson we have to learn uh, from here and also from previous crises, is that austerity does not work. Austerity does not work. I hope uh, you know people in Treasury also get this point, you know, that we cannot pursue austerity anymore. You know, um, and you have pointed it out yourself uh, that uh, you know, quoting. Uh, uh, King's, uh, you know, perspectives on this, that, you know, we need more money uh, rather than less. So I think that that is, is very important for, for beefing up our public health systems and the public service uh, in general, you know, moving towards universal uh, health care and, and so on. And lastly, uh, I think... Uh, you, you mentioned the point by way of example of, you know, what do you do in a situation where there is a, both public and, and private enterprises are financially troubled as a state, you know, in which, you know, you don't even hope of any rescue of any magnitude to this. What do we do? And uh, I think uh, this is a very important question that I think, uh, you know, as a party and uh, an alliance as a whole, we really need to go back to those uh, points of, about strategic intervention in the economy, which means we are calculated on who we finance, uh, you know, or a, or a rescue uh, in the private sector. I mean, the example of, uh, I say Mita is one example, uh, what you call conditions could actually mean that public ownership, you know, we return those uh, into partial or full public ownership, you know, of, of these assets. So we really need to look at, uh, uh, you know, strategic uh, areas that we need to, to use this opportunity of a crisis uh, to intervene as a state. And then again, uh, they, uh, if we open up go for unconventional uh, methods, uh, you know, whether it is a rather worker, you know, using pension funds, uh, uh, you know, or financial institutions, or we use, uh, we use uh, you know, the role of the central bank. Uh, that, that can go a long way uh, in ensuring that at least we're intervening to, uh, you know, uh, strategically. Uh, into those uh, areas where the state can play a critical role in driving uh, industrialization, development, and, and so on. So I think uh, uh, I just wanted to say that I think that's one or two things that uh, I've picked on, pick up from your from your uh, uh, points there. Sure. Thank you, Comrade Daniel Tabang. Tengo and Duma. Tabang. Tabang. Okay. Sorry about that. So I was saying thank you, Chair, and uh, greetings to the Deputy Minister. Um, so I've got a few points to raise. The first one is that uh, we've been hearing the Treasury talking about um, economic reforms and economic uh, or, or restructuring, but um, you know, what are the details of those uh, reforms and restructurings? And the second one is, has to do with the rating agencies. Right? So in the 1970s, um, we, we know that the IMF and the World Bank were used to impose uh, structural adjustment programs, especially in the global south. But now it seems that the role, that role is now being played by the rating agencies rather than, you know, not that the IMF is not doing that, but the rating agencies are, are, are the ones that uh, seem to be leading that, um, that imposition of reforms. 
And notably, we were downgraded right during the, the, the pandemic by, by one of the, the agencies. And, and that for me seemed quite unnecessary. So I'd like to know what do you think that was really about? Um, and the third one would have to do with bailouts. I mean, if we can bail out businesses, why can't we bail out the poor? Unless if we are saying that giving money to the poor is unproductive and therefore wasteful. Um, so, so that's the question. Why can't we bail out the poor in, in the sense of implementing a permanent basic income, not as um, you know, a, a temporary relief measure but as a permanent aspect of building a comprehensive social security system uh, in the country, because um, it seems as if relying on jobs alone, um, you know, we're shooting in the dark. I don't think we're going to create jobs for everyone. So I think maybe part of the unconventional thinking has to go beyond uh, a job-centered, um, you know, approach. And my last point has to do with austerity. Yes, austerity doesn't work. And um, various studies have actually shown that uh, austerity kills people. In the sense that, I mean, how do you cut back government spending when you have 10, 10 million people that are unemployed? Um, so, so yes, so those are, those are, that'll be my input. Thank you. Thank you, Taban. Uh, Comrade Tango. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Am I audible? Yes. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. And thanks to Comrade David's presentation. Um, I have a few questions. Um, the first one is, Obviously, Comrade David um, understand Kwasato's position on the use of uh, uh, pension funds to finance um, state-owned enterprises. But the, the, the question I have is, is that part of the conditionality on financing ESCO, which workers have raised, is the issue that why do, you, why do we have to finance ESCO? when actually it's unbundled? Um, that, that's the first question. I just wanted to click on that one. Then the second one is that, <clears throat> um, as I said, the outbreak was in 2000, uh, 2019 in December. Um, we, we understand what Treasury did. It emerged from a, a democratically agreed upon wage agreement. Um, of 2018. Um, what are they going to do about it? Uh, as a response, was these are frontline workers. We're talking about police, we're talking about soldiers, talking about nurses, we talk about public servants who are actually uh, facing the brunt of the COVID-19. Are doing the, are doing everything possible to rescue our country and our people uh, in uh, under these circumstances. What are they going to do in the budget? Are they going to uh, return back uh, what they've taken from workers? That's the second question. The other question, Comrade David correctly points out that we need a, a state-led uh, infrastructure investment. We agree with that. But the reality of how this, state in, this infrastructure investment is presented, it's in the form of public-private partnerships. Uh, in, in, in that, we know the experiences of that. How it's presented by the presidents. We have been, I've been sitting in engagements about it, and I've uh, not understood the rationale of this private partnership, um, which we we know even World Bank itself in some of its studies have shown uh, the 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 impact of what this partnership does. And a clear clear, a clear example is your. Uh, toll, uh, toll, your, your toll roads, I mean, in, in, in how they, what has happened. So that's that's the other question. What are they thinking about it? Um, 
there, there is a, when we talk about this COVID-19, there is what many people will raise that this is a war situation. And David himself has, has, has raised it. And that the response is that in a war situation, we use unconventional means. Um, I, I can cite example, I don't have time, but what, what is missing in this situation are two issues. One, the question of price controls in a war situation. You look about, talk about data, you talk about essential services, talk about health, um, uh, protective um, clothing and other things that doesn't arise. And that is, uh, the, that's what the state is supposed to be doing, uh, intervening to control prices so that we deal with, that, with the situation. The, the other issue that is within the domain of Comrade David and those who are in the treasury is the issue of capital controls. I mean, we know very well that uh, when the crisis uh, uh, started to take place in our country, we knew, I mean, in developing economies, that what was at risk was extremely capital, massive capital outflows out of developing economies. Many progressive economists have even put a papers and, and, and perspective to say, we need to deal with this thing. But the treasury has done nothing. Even the, the alliance document says, we need to impose capital controls to deal with massive capital outflows out of our economies. And there's not been um, a sufficient work that has been done. I mean, I'm hoping that, uh, for example, on 24th, when the budget is presented, that will be an issue. The last issue I want to raise is that <clears throat> um, with regards to around the measure that the Comrade David is talking about uh, around infrastructure, there's a, the, what, what COVID has put uh, on the table for progressive forces to engage with is the real issue about uh, the uh, lack of investment, uh, uh, which has gone for quite a lot of, for many decades uh, in the health infrastructure and other social infrastructure. We, I, I'm, I mean, I'm hoping that Comrade David would tell us um, that uh, in the coming budget, um, that uh, there will be ex I mean, uh, quite a lot of uh, 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 high impact investment uh, to deal with infrastructure backlog. We know, um, as we are working, as, as you know, in the health sector, that uh, health uh, practitioners are dying on the basis that they are lacking PPEs. And the state, I mean, we know, in the, I mean, particularly in the Eastern Cape, what has been happening is that there's no preparedness around dealing with COVID-19 on the basis of lack of investment in health infrastructure. What is the treasury, what is treasury gonna do about it? These are the issues that I think that Comrade David should assist us uh, in, 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 in this engagement. Because I, I think that uh, we need to be concrete in our response to our concrete reality that is prevailing in not only in South Africa, but in the African country. The last point is around the fact that treasury has not been adamant and, 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 and mobilizing other progressive forces internationally around the use of uh, uh, special drawing rights uh, through IMF. What they've chosen is to look is go for loans when they, there's a possibility that you can use special uh, drawing rights uh, as one of the investment, I mean, as one of the uh, intervention uh, to address not only the Africa's problems, but the whole uh, developing economy's problem. Thank you very much. That was my, those my, my, my contribution. Thank you, very much. <clears throat> Thank you Comrade Tango. And uh, lastly, before we give Comrade David to answer, uh, is Comrade Duma. Duma. Um, thanks, Comrade Stay. I didn't, um, I hadn't actually put my hand up, but I'll use this opportunity to make a few points. Um, the first point is that um, the Treasury response has been completely inadequate. And the reason I say that it has already been shown that the loan guarantee is having no impact. It's been a failure by the authors of the, of the, the policy on the 200 billion land loan guarantee. So my calculations in terms of the net fiscal impact of this um, fiscal stimulus is 1.4% of GDP. Now the output gap in terms of what we need as a country 
so just first thing I have to say is that Treasury proposed 260 billion rands of um, austerity in the budget in February. And on April 30, they proposed another 130 billion rand of austerity. So how is it possible to have 390 billion rand of austerity and talk about a fiscal stimulus? That's the first thing. Now, the output gap, what we have to fill, the GDP that will be lost this year, many people are saying it's a trillion rand. Um, and I just am really amazed about the defeatism that I'm seeing from Treasury that they can't do anything. So whatever it takes is becoming like a slogan. So in terms of filling the one trillion output back, um, gap, I believe one of the major things that we have to talk about is that with unemployment going towards 50%, our whole society will become unviable. Um, we should talk about a basic income grant. I'm talking about 33 million people between 18 and 59, the vast hole in our social security system at the upper bound poverty level, that will be 500 billion rands. But we should look at the net cost of it. I was looking at a study by Monica de Ball, a conservative Brazilian economist based on um, the, the, one, the basic income that um, Bolsonaro put in, in response to COVID. And she said the net cost is far below the, what you call it, the, the actual, gr the gross cost because um, there are economic development spin-offs from the basic income that have to be subtracted from the net cost. And also we can claw back some of the costs through the tax system to people who work, that's the other thing. So I would just like to say that um, I'd really think that we have to move beyond this. And the, the la final thing I wanna say is that we can, there are many ways if we can um, finance this thing from domestic resources alone. And um, there is the whole issue of the PIC, the level of the funding in the PIC is obscene. My calculations say that even after the stock market crash, we still have 1.9 trillion rands in the PIC. Why is that necessary? We've got um, foreign exchange reserves of 900 billion. That is nine, about eight months of our imports. Why do we need so many months of foreign exchange reserves? The fourth thing is that we need to finance um, this higher budget deficit of 14%, which I've predicted for the past two months. And the South African Reserve Bank and the PIC can fund this higher deficit. We can also have a, the prescribed assets or investment accord between um, the financial sector and the government and the stakeholders at NEDLAC. We can also create an investment accord, 500 billion. So I'm just saying um, the in lack of imagination and putting our hands up that there's nothing we can do because there's no fiscal space. We need imagination, creativity. We need a new social impact to get our country out of this situation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Comrade Duma. Uh, uh, before I just give to Comrade David to answer, I just want to alert there are a slew of questions and comments on the chats and on the Q&A. Uh, and so we're going to raise them. Uh, we just want to give Comrade David an opportunity to just respond to these comments and questions that have been raised. There is also going to be the next round. I also saw the hand by Comrade Pethorn. So the, the next round of questions and comments is going to come. Hey, Comrade David. Yeah, uh, let, let me start with the last uh, input by Comrade Duma. I, I think everyone um i mean maybe to put it differently um does treasury have all the policy tools to raise money are some of the suggestions and proposals that we are putting forward do all of them lie within the policy space and instrument um in treasury uh, take the pic or the savings um, for whatever you have to do with those savings a you need to get a mandate from the clients gpf uif and so forth and so forth um, so and, and and that's a point uh, i was making that some of the unconventional methods and measures that we need to uh we which many of us will agree with. The question is whether those 
do they fall within the ambit of, uh, given the way institutionally and legally you've crafted a whole range of things, do all of them fall within the ambit of, of treasury? And that's the point about the fiscal space. Well, we can borrow, that's fine. We can raise tax. Um, and, and, and from a tax point of view, um, like I was saying that, uh, the, 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 I mean, people have been talking about solidarity tax. I think that's one option on the table that you can look at. But if you are to increase tax, uh, you may, um, for different people, actually show, make it difficult for people living to undertake certain economic activities because you are taking almost everything from them and there's no investment to engage in different economic uh, activities. So uh, all I'm saying is that um, the, the, the issues about different alternatives and, 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 and intervention finance, I want to put before you that not all of them fall within the ambit of uh, national uh, treasury. Um, coming back to the point that uh, Comrade Rob, and I fully agree with, uh, with Comrade Rob, and, and I think, um, yeah, the point about unconventional uh, modes or ways of financing, it's, it's actually what we require, unorthodox, just to use this word, unorthodox methods of uh, financing is actually what we need. And I agree with him that uh, in, when you look at the Great Depression, Hoover took a very conservative stance insofar as the fiscal policy is concerned. He was raising taxes. Um, he was uh, arguing for balanced budget. And by the way, even Roosevelt in his first years, he was arguing along the lines that no, we need some conservative fiscal policy stances. He was committed to uh, conservative fiscal policy stances at that time in his first year. And actually, when he even campaigned for the presidential elections, he was, that was his uh, 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 political um, or economic policy position. But what made him shift? It was not endless debates within government, uh, academics, uh, seminars, like it was a must travel. I want to argue that the New Deal was a consequence of the mass mobilization, the workers, the working class was on the ground, demanding, putting together policy positions and demand. Those were, so the New Deal was a concession. It didn't come as a result of some brilliant con, or some benevolent concern from Roosevelt himself. He was pushed, he was looking at the Soviet Union um, he was looking at this, uh, the mass movements going on, which produced the welfare state in Europe. So my, my point here is that um, policy outcome, it's not a function of just how many debates we have in the state amongst ourselves as activists. It's about the mass struggles. Uh, maybe the conditions of COVID don't allow that. <laughs> We, we, we can debate that. Um, any concessions, um, are, uh, particularly concessions that are in the favor of the working class, they come about out of struggles. They don't come about just as endless, you know, institutional maneuvering there and there. It's a function of shifting the balance uh, of power. We can list all the proposals, all the policy options. If there's anyone who's got rich experience in this country around policy proposal, policy alternative is the party and COSATU. And the question is why these policy positions are not winning the day? That's a political economic question that we need to, 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 to answer. I mean, all the proposals that uh, Comrade have put forward, uh, um, I mean, some of the unconventional methods of financing, the proposals are out there. Uh, the, you know, proposals such as solidarity tax, you know, how we use uh, the savings uh, to channel them to a certain developmental outcomes, the purchase of um, the uh, government bonds by the Reserve Bank, all those things are out there. Um, and, and, and by the way, going back to the issue on the 
you know, shifting the balance of power and all that. The welfare state is an outcome of that. It didn't come about because, you know, the section of the elite took a decision that no, 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 now that we are concerned about the plight of the poor, let's just make certain concessions and then it, it, it happened. It came as a consequence uh, of struggle. And my concern in all these conversations, lack of what are the debates to basically shift the balance of uh, power in society to basically undertake certain progressive uh, measures without being populist, uh, without uh, going out there and, and, and saying that we will do the impossible and all these kind of things. But what is, what is missing in this conversation is basically that. Um, I do think that uh, in as much, we, we, we should consider Comrade uh, Devza the bailing out of the some of the strategic companies. And, and again, that also depends on the financing mechanism um, and, and money that we basically have to generate in order to do all those things. Um, Asolo Mittal for me is strategic. Sasol, for instance, is in trouble. And someone was saying that uh, if we're not careful, Sasol is going to be bought by other people outside South Africa. And they're going to have to buy it at a very cheap price. Because from what I'm told, is that the share price has significantly gone down. And the issue is that what do you do with such an asset, which if you are to uh, restructure it, it can play, it has played a major role. I mean, uh, I think it was established 1950 by the apartheid regime. And it played a major role in aiding and supporting the economy in, in different ways. Yes, they went out to bend their fingers in the US through the kind of investment that they've basically undertaken. So I think we, we cannot say that uh, we shouldn't think about um, bailing out some of the privately owned entities. Yes, by making sure that uh, government buys equity, but government ownership on its own is not sufficient. Uh, I mean, I'm speaking to the convented. Uh, we need to also to think about how these companies uh, are operationally efficient for us to uh, make sure that they don't become a burden on the fiscals, but they add value. Uh, in the economy as a whole. Um, Tabang, I think your point about uh, the basic income grant, like I said, I would not have a problem with that, but the issue is that how do you basically finance it? Um, and my, my preoccupation and other people's preoccupation is how do you basically <laughs> make sure that this unconventional financing measures are essentially realized. And then, like I said, not all of them fall within the ambit of national treasury or finance. Uh, we've got to, as Comrade Rob was saying, that there has to be a, a consensus around that issue and bring everyone under one table and say, these are the things that we should be doing uh, to basically find ways of financing uh, the post um, COVID economic reconstruction. And some of the things um, like you, structural reforms. Um, and I know that uh, the, the party talks about structural transformation as opposed to structural reforms. Um, I mean, my take, uh, I, was, I was saying to other companies that uh, structural reforms can also be a Marxist. I mean, Boris Kakaliski, um, he uses the concept of structural reforms. Of course, he uses it differently from the World Bank and the IMF. So I think the National Treasury paper, it does have some of the most important things that I think we need to seriously look at. I mean, for instance, the issue about network industry, that is essential about infrastructure. And we agree that uh, for us to and reconstruct this economy. It's important that the economic infrastructure works, our ports work, our rail work, electricity, water, all those things. We do agree that they need to, uh, to work. And, and I think 
We should not be ashamed also to say that economic recovery or reconstruction under capitalism will also mean uh, recovery of the profits because economic growth under capitalism is about the profits that businesses make and it's out of the profits that they make that you're able to tax them, they're able to employ. Uh, without that, you are not going to have economic growth and, and, and development and therefore, um, the issue is about what, what should be the mode of recovery of the profitability of our companies and, and so forth. It's, it's a question of the mode because you can recover through, for lack of better way, through neoliberalism, or you can recover through some sort of social democratic uh, program. You can recover through uh, fascism. Um, it, 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 it's also possible. So. As, as, because I don't think that uh, as the left in the current moment, we, 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 we're talking about transcending the system. We're talking about how do you make um, the system to produce better developmental uh, outcomes. And there's no one way of recovering, of reconstructing the very same system that we are very critical of. It's about what, what is the better kind of, if you like, non-reform, missed reforms uh, within the, the, the current system. And I do think that some of the things that are entailed in the um, document, which was popularly known as National Treasury document, this thing that I think, I mean, I, I agree with, um, like your network industry, the issue about the labor market reforms, um, we may have an issue insofar as that is concerned. And that's why some of us, we said, for that specific issue, you've got to resolve it by engaging through NEDLEG. You can't put it in a paper and make it a policy paper without engaging labor through the right processes, which is essentially a NEDLEG. So I think the task now, it's a, this a post um, COVID reconstruction, what, what is the mode of recovery? And comment Rob, that it's, a, you know, um, Fascism was another way through which in the past um, the recovery was done. I doubt that the, the prospect for fascism in our country are very, um, very, very slim. Uh, I, I don't see the prospects of uh, fascism, uh, including, and by fascism here, I mean taking people's democratic rights and uh, banning everything and, 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 and you know, that's what I mean, basically taking everyone's democratic rights. I don't think that society, even in the US, notwithstanding the, for lack of better, when the madness that uh, the Trump is displaying and all this kind of, I, I do not think that uh, the conditions, he may desire to have fascism. I don't think that the political conditions uh, will enable him to basically have a, a fascist type of uh, recovery. Yes, he may have racist outbursts. I mean, with the rise of uh, the uh, uh, Black Lives Matter in the wake of the um, uh, brutal killing of uh, George Floyd, I think the political consciousness of the world is at a different place. And therefore, I, I, I doubt that uh, we, with the prospects of um, fascism are there, even here in South Africa. So I do not see, yes, I think you will see the, uh, the fragmentation, Trump trying to, and, and everyone trying to undermine uh, multilateralism, those kind of platforms that we more likely to see. And I think that Trump is not, um, acting out of stupidity, this uh, trade uh, withdrawal from the multilateralism, from, uh, um, um, I mean, putting tariffs, uh, protecting the US economy. It is out of the material reality that the US for from the uh, 70s has lost the competitiveness. The manufacturing of the US has lost the competitiveness and as a result, the American working class has also lost jobs. So it's not by accident that Trump will say, buy America. And how do you buy America, protect the borders by way of raising the tariffs? Higher America, you know, even though 
He may not fully do it because sections of uh, capital in that country, they do need cheap labor, which come out of, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, people who migrate into the US and they don't have proper legal status and they are easily dismissed and all this kind of thing. So uh, all I'm saying is that uh, in as much as we will see some nationalist ultra nationalist response, which is quite reactionary, uh, the prospects for fascism, both in the country and the world, I doubt that uh, the, the prospects are, are very slim in my view, and I could be wrong. Um, so I think Tango wants me to lay out what the minister is gonna say uh, next week. Uh, um, <laughs> It's, yeah, Wednesday or Thursday. I'm sorry, Tang, I'm gonna disappoint you on this one. Um, all I can say is that the budget presented in Feb um, has forced a government to go and, re and present um, an adjustment of the budget it was, which was presented in Feb uh, in basically to say that the impact of COVID has been as follows. The revenue from revenue side, this is where we are from the borrowing requirements as a consequence of the collapse of our tax revenue. This is what we need in order to finance the deficit that we basically have. This is how we have restructured the budget to respond to the um, the call, the, for lack of better word, the stimulus package, which um, I mean, many, including national treasury, we do agree that it's not necessarily stimulus uh, because stimulus you add additional money to stimulate the economy. All we've done under these circumstances is essentially to uh, cut expenditure there and there in order to rechannel it towards um, social grants, unemployment uh, to the unemployed uh, people. So I do not think that um, this is a, it, it's not a new budget. The new budget will be done um, in either yeah, next year. Uh, so I, all I'm saying is that I, I think, uh, A, I'm not <laughs> laying it out there that this is what the minister because Teng was saying, what are we going to say about the health? What are we going to say about uh, the wage bill? Of course, there are negotiations going, ongoing there in so far as the wage bill is concerned. Um, so I, I wouldn't speak at length, except saying what I've said in so far as the, 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 the budget is concerned. And I fully agree with Comrade Tengo that um, you know data must fall and certain prices we need to look seriously around um, the cost. Um, certain services or administered prices, uh, including prices that are set by the private sector in so like data. Um, and there was a study by the Competition Commission. I don't know where it is in terms of the recommendation in so far as data is concerned, because we cannot talk just about dealing with the cost of doing business in South Africa without talking about the cost of living, particularly for the working class. We should be talking about fixing PRASA uh, as well as part and parcel of making sure that the cost of living in South Africa, cost of transportation for the working class are also um, 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 uh, reduced. So all my, my parting shot is this, Comrade's policy is a function of uh, trust struggle, you know better than I do. Um, the, the policy debates and conversation like this is just for us to clarify thought, so that we've got very current uh, arguments to put out there, convince people who should be benefiting out of certain policy alternatives to really convince and empower for with, with, with us. So I think. Um, I, I, let me end it there by saying that uh, policy, I mean, Hayek the, uh, and the Milton, they were there in the thirties, by the way, the neoliberals as we call them, they only won the day after the seventies. It's not as if they were debating with Keynes. 
in the thirties. They were debating with Oscar Lange, you know, it was talking about uh, uh, planning Soviet Union, market socialist debate and all those kind of things. They were there, there was no short of ideas, but what becomes dominant is a function of the balance of power. So I, I, I want to leave it there that uh, um, the, the policy, it's, it's not just, a, it's, it's a part of the class struggle. It's not a function of, uh, uh, debate, debate and clarity of thought is, is quite important because we need to be clear in providing a current argument to whatever we're basically proposing. Like I said, I mean, Hayek, uh, Friedman, uh, uh, Milton, he was there in the ditches making all sorts of arguments, but they were not taken seriously, uh, partly because the balance of power was quite different. So like I said, Roosevelt, he didn't adopt the new deal because he loved the working class, he loved the poor. He, he was forced to do so. Uh, he had to make certain concessions uh, to, and, and that's why in the United States, the welfare state, um, it's not the same as the Sweden one, Swedish one, because the labor movement has been very weaker compared to what you'll call the Scandinavian uh, countries. Uh, so it, it was not just the question of culture, debate, and all this kind of thing. It's, it's a function of shifting the balance of power uh, to really make sure that uh, yeah, certain policy outcomes are, are realized. Uh, with that, let me end it here. I'm also advise that uh, Cosatu House, they want to close here because, um, yeah, like, like I told you, uh, Comrade Bengu, that uh, I'm, I'm speaking from Kasati House. So, um, and yeah. So I don't know what time do you want us to end? Um, okay. Thanks, Comrade David. There's, maybe we're going to allow one, one last round of questions. There's a, a number of questions that I'm going to give Comrade Alex. He's going to read from uh, the chat here, as well as from the Facebook platforms. And then there is something from uh, Comrade Pethorn, and I also recognize Comrade Rasikan. Uh, uh, and so they will come in that order. So Comrade Alex will, will read through some of the questions and comments, and then it will be Comrade Pethorn, and then Comrade Rasikan. Comrade Alex. I think uh, uh, comrades, Comrade David uh, replied to a question asked by Ayanda on Facebook. I will read uh, the question asked by Regin Gorsi. That is, why does the treasury repeat deficit expenditure instead of non-market based ones? Have you ever considered non-market approaches to financing deficits? There is a comment that I will leave because you recognize Comrade Rasigan uh, is the one who wrote that comment. And of course, I must say there has been a, a, a very strong debate uh, in the chat box regarding uh, the, the, the universal basic income grant. If you may allow me to just register one or two points, Comrade Stay. Uh, firstly, I think we have a, a, a big amount of work to do. I will just make use of this moment to highlight the following. I have been reading OECD's uh, publication. It's a book actually titled Economic Policy Reforms. I think it was initiated after the 2008 crisis. And since that time, uh, from starting from around 2010, it was published annually. The reason why I am mentioning this is the comment by Comrade David about structural reforms. If you look at the OECD economic policy reforms, uh, the subtitle is going for growth, those who are interested. What the National Treasury revealed as its paper in 2019 is actually a direct copy of OECD structural reforms. And then those who would like to read that, uh, 
uh, uh, the 2017 OECD structural reforms summarize the 2014, 15, and 13 ones on page 289 to page 292. That is the 2017 one. And when you talk about uh, network industries, the content of these neoliberal reforms advocated by the OECD is not Marxist, it is not revolutionary. In summary, that National Treasury paper, you know, if I, if I read the OECD 2017, you will hear that I'm reading the National Treasury paper because it is a direct copy and paste. The basic thrust running through those structural reforms is not necessarily an upgrading of our network industries, no. Those network industries are identified with railroads, energy, uh, water ports, and communications. So those structural reforms are simply saying, in fact, they coalesce around one idea. We can state participation in these industries and open them up for private sector participation and competition. That is what the OECD is saying. And then that is copied directly as is without any additions into what we are told is the national treasury paper. And I am deliberately mentioning the page numbers of the OECD 2017 going for growth where the OECD is summarizing this. So a presentation of the national treasury structural reforms is not a presentation of Marxist or revolutionary or even uh, progressive. And the reason why I am mentioning this is that Comrade David makes a, an important point about class struggle as being important in informing the direction of policy. Look, the OECD and the forces behind it did not have to embark on mass mobilization in South Africa but their views were copied and directly pasted and given to South Africans as the national treasury paper. Compare that to how that paper was launched in South Africa. There was no consultation within the Alliance and in the country. It was released within the ANC. There was an apology written about that. There was fear that the paper would be leaked. And regardless of commitments for consultation, the paper was not even amended. The president went ahead in his state of the nation address to refer to those uh, structural reforms. So when we talk about structural reforms, it is not just the question of name, it is the content. For example, the labor market structural reform is not the only neoliberal reform I have mentioned that the main goal of the OECD structural reform is to replace state participation with private sector participation and competition. That's the key. And as a Marxist, you would know which ideological framework advocates that. And another document, if uh, colleagues wish to consult, is the uh, International Monetary Fund 2018 country report. It has a page where it is summarized. So these things, uh, you, you, you have a national treasury that is, that is assumed to be driving policy. However, this policy content is foreign driven and foreign informed. While there is no consultation, uh, uh, even within the same movement that is in government. So uh, while I accept and I agree fully with the idea of you know, mass mobilization and uh, the role of the working class in informing policy. I just wanted to highlight how capital ideas are copied and directly pasted and given to society as the policy direction. And uh, in one of the ANC economic uh, 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 transformation commission where I served, 
there was a process on who was consulted. I mean, the Minister of uh, Finance gave us, you know, a number of meetings that were held. And in none of those meetings, I mean, there were foreign people, what, 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 what. So you didn't have that. So I wrote that in our notes. I just uh, wished to, to highlight that, to indicate uh, that we must even be careful because, uh, uh, it is even very easy to predict what the Reserve Bank it is doing. So, Comrade David, I support him on the measures he proposes for, for the Reserve Bank. But it is very easy. I mean, you just need to read what the IMF is saying, and then you will summarize the direction that the Reserve Bank is taking. Wait for wait. So, in other words, you have a Reserve Bank that is independent of from national democracy, but not independent from foreign control and coordination. So I can just table a number of IMF things. Even when you listen to the Reserve Bank governor speaking, you are just reserved, listening to the conveyor of IMF ideas in South Africa. So, so I thought uh, it is important to highlight that, but I must say that uh, uh, I thank you very much, Comrade David. You, you, you have done very well. Dialogue is important in consolidating agreement. And that is the first step towards driving change. So I also agree with you that perhaps COVID-19 is imposing limitations in terms of mass struggle. We do need to, to embark on mass struggle in order to dislodge the stranglehold, foreign monopoly capital stranglehold on the national treasury and the IMF and, and the Reserve Bank, because uh, we are an independent country and we must assert our democratic national sovereignty in order to inform police. Thank you. Thanks. Combat Pet, and then after Combat Pet, Combat Rasikan. Thanks, comrades. Um, I want to zoom in um, on the uh, issue about the uh, bailing out of the poor and uh, the universal basic income grant. And um, I want to suggest that we need to think about this one a little bit further. I think it's very clear that in our economic recovery, we need um, a lot of bottom up thinking and a lot of bottom up measures. Uh, particularly if we if we want to have uh, alternative viewpoints, more revolutionary viewpoints, and so on. And um, what I want to suggest is that we have to think beyond the basic income grant. What, what I've been noticing since this COVID nineteen, we we fought tooth and nail for this income grant, and after four weeks, I mean, it's partly because of resistance from the the, the minister um, and concerns about the affordability and concerns about it becoming permanent. Um, but after getting the basic income grant, we finally were, were in a, afforded an amount of 135 Rand a month. And basically what I noticed among workers in the informal economy is pretty, although they all have applied for that basic income grant, as we know, just about nobody's been paid it. So people sort of, uh, I noticed kind of losing the appetite for even pushing for the basic income grant given you know the small amount. And most people have been wanting to get back to work. And this informal economy is, is going to increase um, because a lot of formal workers are losing their employment. So what we, uh, have sort of in front of us is, is a much larger, larger informal economy um, and of people who are not necessarily wedded to the idea of, of staying at home and waiting for a, a basic income grant. So I think we have to be, uh, we have to think out of the box um, on the question of what we mean about bailing out the poor. Um, I don't think it's an entirely a treasury issue but it is uh, an issue that requires uh, our government departments to think outside of their silos and to work together. Something which, by the way, has been working much better during this COVID time. We've been finding the collaboration between government departments really a whole lot better than it was uh, prior to this. 
and recalcitrant ministries like the Department of Social Development have been forced to the table, as have recalcitrant people like Santaco and so on, um, who tried to use this opportunity just to get like bigger grants for themselves. It doesn't appear they were thinking about their drivers when they were thinking about that. So I think uh, that I, I, I'm fully in favor of us having a very big part. Uh, there's no way we can have an economic recovery plan that doesn't have a very sizable part about um, bailing out the poor. But then when we disaggregate and look at who the poor are, we're looking at people who are in the informal economy, who are in some of these uh, sort of unregulated industries like the platform economy and the gig economy. Um, so those are all, you know, what I'm thinking about. And then those new people who were in the formal sector who are going to join the informal by the time we, we finish all of this. So I think we need to have a package of policies and grants. Uh, things like um, uh, policies about the registration of domestic workers and taxi drivers who, uh, in theory, do have sexual determinations. In theory, they're covered by the labor laws. But in practice, as we've been seeing, while this uh, need for grants has come up, the majority of them are not properly registered. They're not registered under UIF. They're not registered under the um, workman's compensation. So, I mean, we have been able to use the NEDLAC space, for example, to uh, get the issue of the taxi driver's registration onto the table and to say to those taxi owners who are asking for these uh, uh, for this relief fund that they can only get that if they can prove that they have uh, registered their drivers and that they have registered them under UIF and so on. Um, the, the question of the integration of, of waste pickers in solid waste management policies and um, uh, the issue of having new inclusive city planning with public transport and uh, a, a relook at public space management, a new issue that's now on the agenda in NEDLAC. And that, of course, brings in people like Cogta and Selga and so on. Um, and then what we've been finding, workers in the informal economy are able to get back to work more quickly than uh, big businesses that need to be bailed out um, because they've already collapsed. Um, so, but because of the fact that most workers in the informal economy have used up whatever savings they've got, they also need some cash grants, but the kind of cash grants that are needed to get people back to work in the informal economy are a whole lot smaller. And so uh, the kinds of grants one would look at there can go a lot further than the kinds of grants that one needs for, for the bigger uh, businesses. So it, it should be something which is part of the tre treasury's package is the getting people back to work, which as I've said, most of them prefer to get back to work than to wait for basic income grants. The, uh, and and if, if one has this kind of um, investment, then the affordability of the basic income grant, which is still necessary because it's necessary for those that can't get back to work, uh, it could become a whole lot less if we haven't just decided that the poor will just be accommodated by a basic income grant. I don't think that's um, satisfactory. Um, there need to be certain um, uh, uh, investments during the COVID period. For example, uh, providing the, the PPEs which are needed by people like uh, public transport passengers by workers in the informal economy who don't have employers that they can demand these from. These need to be provided um, as part of the, uh, the package for those workers in the informal economy who are getting back to work, um, but who've got to uh, apply new protocols and so on. And I think, you know, what we're looking at is a, is a policy package whereby government departments work more closely with organizations of workers in the informal economy, because they are the people who can assist in the management of public space, in social behavior. I see there's a whole new task team now about social behavior. It's not clear what that task team is going to do. One of the ways to deal with social behavior, which, which is an issue for us at the current phase of people getting back to work while we still have a very risky situation in terms of increasing uh, infections. 
Um, and then, you know, those, those public uh, schemes for managing public space and social behavior can also be used as sites for health testing, et cetera. So um, I think uh, we need to um, think beyond the basic income grant, please. I'd like us really to, to become creative about that. That's one of the areas where we have to do things which are unconventional. Um, I think uh, I, I'm quite aware that a lot of this doesn't fall within Treasury's ambit, but basically Treasury together with um, other departments. And as I've said, I think that the basis for that uh, cooperation is being seen. It's one of the one of the positive things that's been happening in this in this COVID period. We're seeing things happening at NEDLAC that we've never seen before, and we're seeing um, uh, departments uh, pay attention to our sector in a way that has never happened before. Um, and uh, basically, um, I think uh, we we need to to create this kind of a package, and I think it should come from. Uh, organizations like the SACP, like the unions and the organizations of workers in the informal economy um, as, as a working class um, initiative to the, the more um, creative means of, of, of bailing out the, the poor, which is going to be a lot larger than it was before we went into COVID. Thanks, comrades. Thanks, comrade Pat. Comrade Rasekan. So good evening, comrades. And I know we've uh, also moved quite a bit time-wise. So I have posted uh, a question onto the uh, Zoom chat, but I, I want to raise a more fundamental issue and it may not be possible to engage with it more deeply, but primarily in terms of the lessons that we've learned all the way across from the Great Depression, the 2007, 2008 crisis, and the current catastrophe that's in front of us. I would encourage that we base our views also on the actual performance of the institutions that are domestic, not just in terms of theoretically, or at least by textbook, what these institutions are meant to do, but rather what they actually do. And let's keep in, in context the type of choices that confront us at the moment impact on real lives. And in terms of those real lives, I think drawing a distinction between uh, the, uh, the, the possibilities of a truly productive um, economy coming to work uh, versus uh, what we have, the exclusivity and the exclusion of large numbers of people from that, uh, I think still deserves a huge amount of attention. Uh, I would really discourage a view that the new normal um, or normalization means returning to the old um, or, or the previous uh, um, uh, compromises uh, that created the situation that we are in. Thank you. Thank you very much, Comrade Rasekhan. Uh, I'm going to give straight to Comrade David. Uh, there's a question from someone was anonymous who was noting uh, the absence of any discussion on wealth tax. Um, Comrade David. I must uh, declare that uh, just in the interest of transparency, that Tango is fighting me on the tax messages. Answer my questions. It says I've not answered some of his questions. So um, <clears throat> one of the questions, and if I understood it very we'll well, you. <laughs> I'm in trouble, I'm getting text messages. Hey, answer my question to you. Look, insofar as financing of public infrastructure, I do think that uh, there has to be clear choices that the labor movement and the working class need to make, particularly as it relates to the, um, um, let's say, etols as an example. So you, you say to, you give a mandate to the uh, PIC and other institutional investors 
We want you to go and invest in infrastructure, but that infrastructure must give us returns so that our pensions are safe. So those returns means that uh, when government goes out and lay out the infrastructure, it holds as an example. Um, government must pay back the um, money that government has borrowed through borrowing, and you are talking about borrowing from the workers' money, the pensions, and government must pay back that money. And we come back and say, no, the user pay principle must not apply. But at the same time, we want these investments to perform and give us better returns. I'm just using the e tools as an example. Um, so we, we've got to be clear, give clear mandates to the um, the yeah, pension, uh, the, the, the asset managers that, okay, go and invest and in our return, we're willing to, you know, um, have returns at this level, not at this level. But if you say you're giving them a mandate to have returns at a higher level, um, there are implications. So every decision we basically take, it does have its own uh, impl implement, I mean, implication because some of this money is that government borrows. It's not even from the, if you like, some of it, not, not necessarily from, I mean, if I must just get my figures correct, almost 570 something billion that government has borrowed to do a lot of things uh, and government must pay back that, that money just to make sure that um, that money, it's, uh, you know, it goes back to the, uh, 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 because getting this money from the saving doesn't mean that it needs to be invested recklessly and it doesn't perform and all that. So, and, and it's my point about this conundrum, this uh, contradiction that uh, we um, have to find a way uh, of resolving. And again, on ESCOM, the point I was simply making was that it is important to uh, say, if we are saying that uh, debt should be converted into equity, we should not end there, we must insist, as Cosati has done, to make sure that ESCOM does function. In fun it's, it's, it's the same logic about bailing out private um, uh, companies. What, what are the conditions that we make because if we don't put proper conditions, this money can go into the pocket of the few through corruption, through paying high bonuses, and there's no efficiency. We still have a problem in so far as the provision of electricity is concerned. The, the last point, it's on the, the network industries. All, all I was saying is that if recovery, reconstruction will be predicated on the restoration of profitability. And I have explained why profitability uh, under capitalism is a necessary condition for growth and then all, all other things that we need to. Then you've got to make sure that uh, there is indeed reliable supply of electricity, not just for business, but also for the working class, reliable uh, supply of water, uh, transportation, communication, and so forth and so forth. And also make sure that some of these network industries, they don't charge, they are not a law unto themselves. I mean, Transnet, the water boards, uh, they can, charge as much as they want. No one is regulating them. And they pass this um, cost to uh, the working class, to businesses, and that makes it very difficult for them to basically operate. So the need for regulating them in the same way as you regulate um, ESCOM through NASA and, and so forth and so forth. It's something that I don't think that we should just um, 
dismiss it and, and, and treat it as unimportant. Electricity, as an example, if the mining industry say, no, no, we can generate our own electricity, shouldn't we allow them to generate their own uh, electricity if they do have certain capabilities and still sort out ESCOM and make sure that it does provide electricity to certain industries, to the poor and so forth and so forth. And the last point around the network industry, you know, small towns um, are in trouble. And one of the potential ways of growing them is just to make sure that um, the branch lines uh, from town X, the tr transnet rails and, and branch lines are reactivated. But transnet, they will say, no, we don't have adequate funds to basically um, rebuild and resuscitate some of those branch lines. Um, their capacity as well to do, to sort out ports, given their balance sheets, they may not be able to get enough money to basically um, sort out. And uh, Mercedes-Benz, for instance, it's, it's in um, East London. They're the major tenant. They are the major user of that port. So they come and say, look, uh, allow us to run this port. W what is the right answer? insofar as that is concerned. And they come, some of them, for the branch lines that look, allow us to um, uh, uh, revive these branch lines and maybe we can discuss the conditions under which this branch line is service, is used, safety, um, and, and conditions under which you can take this branch line back to, to the state. I, I think these are some of the things that we need to at a concrete level, think about and, and say, under these conditions, what is the most prudent tactical way of basically dealing with this, um, with this? Because it doesn't help to say, no, 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 Transnet, we want you to sort out the branch lines and it never happens. We want you to sort the ports and it doesn't happen. Um, so, it, it, it's, it's some of those dilemmas that uh, we need to um, help each other to think about. Uh, I mean, I'm just talking about the network industry. And so far as the labor market policy, I've got my strong views that uh, actually the law does allow, if you want to be exempted, there's a process through which you can be exempted from the collective bargaining uh, agreement. I do not think that uh, we, we need to do some uh, reforms in so far as that is concerned. But like I said, if people want us to debate that, um, let it go to NETLAC, let labor get involved, let everyone have a conversation in so far as that is concerned. Because I don't think that some of the um, labor market reforms that people are suggesting, they make sense uh, because it already in the law, uh, some of the things that people say we should do are already entailed in the in the law. So, uh, but for on the network industries, I think we, we we can debate and how we reconcile that with the issue on infrastructure and what are the best unconventional ways of basically financing uh, some of these uh, interventions so far as the infrastructure is concerned. I mean, um, the point that uh, Comrade Pet was making, I mean, I have no, I mean, so it was a comment and I think I fully agree that I think we need to think creatively beyond a basic income grant. And by saying so, it's not an opposition to the idea of a basic income grant. It simply say, let's have a broader notion of uh, the livelihood uh, for the poor and this other intervention that we should be thinking about. But having said that, I think this conversation for me was very useful. And like I said, all what I've said is based on the paper which I'm trying to uh, clean up. And I think this uh, comments and critique, and I'll send to some of you to further provide uh, 
yeah, critique and, and, and comments. Uh, so it's a paper that I, you know, it's essentially meant to help me to clarify certain things in, in my idea, in my head, and also to use it as a, a paper to continuously have conversations with comrades so that one is clear in his uh, head on this ongoing debate. But I think all we are saying is that uh, unconventional ways of doing things, not only finance, because COVID has changed almost everything. And the crisis before the crisis has already uh, put certain conventions out of the window. And therefore we need to rethink the way we think about policy, but uh, without uh, organizing mobilizing, um, yeah, policy doesn't shift things. Policy is also a function of, uh, actually it's a function of the uh, balance of power and part of shifting the balance of power, it's through this conversation, having clear ideas on what to be done under the, the current circumstances. I think uh, I want to thank Chris Honey Institute for having given me this opportunity and the feedback that I got from comrades uh, it's quite, it's quite, it's quite useful. It also helped me to deal with certain blind spots, and I'll continuously, um, yeah, engage comrades. And if this opportunity uh, presents itself, I will not hesitate to take it again and and come and present whatever ideas that one have um, in 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 trying to think about the reconstruction post COVID. And, and, and other issues that are quite important for the working class. Thank you. Thank you, Comrade uh, Stembizu. Thank you very much, Comrade uh, David. Uh, thank you, Comrades. Uh, we have gone past our allocated time, which was two hours, and uh, 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 the discussion has been quite fruitful and robust. Um, um, and we are, uh, even though we're gonna end now this session, but we uh, we are hoping that the conversations are still gonna continue, uh, even outside of this particular session. Uh, while mentioning that maybe maybe on our way towards closing, let me mention that uh, essentially we have a series of webinars that we are lining up. Uh, Obviously, right now we are still dealing with the broadly what we can call frame around macroeconomic policy, and then after those, we will actually have also start an, another series of seminars more now particularly around industrial policy, uh, and then identify specific sectors and sector by sector in which we are trying to really uh, uh, interrogate uh, what are the ways then of incorporating those. Uh, within this broader framework that we are trying to come up with, and 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 and, uh, and probably just the the the, the take off, I think for me as we end, is probably the link between uh, I think what Comrade David is quite uh, uh, has been mentioning that uh, uh, probably probably what we can pick up more on this is around how actual struggles uh, are quite significant. In actually, what's going to be the outcome of the of the kind of direction of the kinds of uh, 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 trajectory that actually is taken uh, at a post, at a policy level, but also in terms of political decisions that are being made, uh, uh, and I think that is quite significant. Uh, and so, so as we continue, we will we will explore many of these questions. And hopefully, uh, 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 since, since we have quite a, a broad group of what we can call progressively left here, uh, we can actually be able to culminate, this can culminate into some kinds of those kind of very practical and, and also uh, the, uh, an advance towards specific struggles that really they, uh, uh, that really they need to be reached, uh, uh, especially in line with what was mentioned by Comrade Alex that uh, 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 the idea of class struggle is, is quite significant. Of, of, obviously, it's quite significant to note that though there are specific sectors or class interests that uh, it doesn't look like they have to struggle, they just they, they have a pathway, almost uh, an expressway, 
into the into the avenues of power. And so these are the things that are that we still that, that we definitely need to continue. And hopefully, as the webinars continue, and much more further engagement in which we are trying to link up also with with other institutes and with other both academic as well as uh, social movement things hopefully that this can culminate and essentially grow into really some some, some progressive program uh, and so on that note we really appreciate uh, 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 your availability comrades and the very uh, robust questions and comments that have been made uh, we have i must just note that we have copied a number of the comments that came both in the chats and some of the on the facebook and we are hoping that some of them we can be able to actually uh, uh, streamline and so that they can help also in terms of informing even the kinds of further engagements that we're gonna have and uh, lastly uh, we'd like to thank comrade david uh, uh, really for uh, 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 for coming and for leading us in this very stimulating uh, discussion that we had today and yes, uh, 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 with, uh, uh, you are very much welcome that when uh, in whatever, either in this paper, in the next phase or whatever else that really you feel that uh, you want a platform to be able to, to have uh, a presentation on, uh, uh, that will be very much welcome. And so we, we will definitely uh, put an ear out there to, 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 to to find out if there's anything further. And so, comrades, thank you very much. Uh, just on the last hour announcements, we will be posting uh, uh, the next webinar, which is gonna be on Thursday next week. Uh, probably by Monday, let's test, we will have the fuller details of that, of that webinar. Thank you very much. One announcement, New Development yes. Bank approved uh, 1 billion US dollars for South Africa. I'll leave it there. I don't know what that, uh, but from the brick, <laughs> that's good to note here. Yeah. So, <laughs> David, <laughs> how yes. is my brick bank? As, David, uh, I, with yeah. my workers' money then, now, workers' money, workers', <laughs> workers money. What are I going to do about it in the budget? I'll be very happy well, about that. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, comrades. Thank you very much. Uh, 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 please take care. Thank you.